sadistic little snickers fill your ears. The taunting strengthens your fears. You slowly scan the endless dark, like a diver looking for sharks. A pitter-patter of feet to your right. You raise your hand for the light. You reach for the lamp's knob and it slowly turns. One click, two clicks, no light. The feeling you get burns. Tracing the cord, your fingers run over a sharp end, and your mental state quickly begins to transcend. Someone had cut the cord. The adrenaline kicks in that you have stored. You gaze, fixated upon all shapes in your room, looking for the bringer of doom. Passing cars, high beams illuminate something in your room that scares away your life. In the corner of your room, there stands a man with a wicked smile and a shiny knife. Now, my dear friends, so glad you could join me around the campfire. Draw in a little closer, because I've got a story to tell you. And it goes something like this. My client, Jose Araniaga, died a wealthy man. More than moderately wealthy, but not quite at the level of celebrities or entertainers. He suffered from a rare condition that affected muscle and soft tissue that would create fatigue toxins more regularly than the average person. More than three dozen steps, and he'd be in moderate pain. If he walked a quarter of a mile, he'd be close to death. I suppose he is, was, another man. With all the resources to do anything he wants, yet he can't find himself capable of doing anything worthwhile. The reason I am recollecting all these details is that I was hired to complete a task. Not quite the typical fixer or PI task, but on the higher level of macabre. Apparently, a graveyard for the wealthy with 24-7 surveillance and the uh, cheapest experienced security guards money can buy wasn't enough to leave his corpse in place. The police had next to zero leads, they couldn't find any trace of physical evidence of who excavated the corpse. It started with the casket. No signs of forced entry, crowbar or anything. It just seemed as if it was very easy to whoever stole his corpse to open it without busting a sweat. Moreover, there's no for sure identification on the security tapes. The fog was incredibly dense that night. So dense, even with night vision, they failed to capture anything that could have been the perpetrator. Now, I'm almost exclusively stateside with my job. I'm not very fond of crossing the Atlantic. But, due to time constraints on money I would make in a couple of months, being needed in just a few weeks, I took this job in order to cut the time to money ratio. Even as a native Spanish speaker, I'm not fond of this country. The birthplace of my first language. Yet I feel this place has nothing in particular to offer. Hmm. Maybe I'm being crass. But I don't like the way Europe is compared to America. I ended up bringing my revolver with me. As a just in case. God forbid I actually have to use it. Or worse, get in trouble. End up in a Spanish jail and not get extradited. I had a very robotic conversation with Mrs. Araniaga. She seemed easily in her forties, grey hair cut short, almost like Ellen DeGeneres. Average build, cute face, definitely not out of the league of Mr. Araniaga. She seemed so apprehensive about his death, anxious as if she still has to worry nightly as she falls asleep in a guest chair in a hospital room. Can't do much, but show sympathy 
from someone suffering from an unknown person or persons, blatantly removing, maybe even destroying, her husband's cadaver. While he was alive, Mr. Aranyaga was anything but well-loved. He started off as an architect, from what I saw. A very calm man, who cared about angles and visions, more than what was already in front of him. Eventually he got tired of designing buildings, so he started purchasing land, demolishing buildings, houses, buying farmer's land, and setting out to create new, modern architecture. Of course, this left a considerable amount of debt. Debt that was abolished, as his death was deemed by the courts to make him not liable to repay back the millions of euros he'd used to show off his arrogance to the locals. She said, I've never met anyone with this much ambition, this much pride and humility in his work. While yes, he was physically meek, but mentally and emotionally, he was unstoppable. I can't imagine what he would have been like if he was able to move, to show his inner strength throughout his body. So, a gimp makes fantastic buildings, decides he wants to modify the landscape, inside the city and outside of it, because he won't be able to leave a mark of him putting his signature of concrete and iron wherever you look. The more and more I hear about this man, I think of a narcissist. A low-key narcissist. Not extremely outward with his deposition. Certainly more about himself than anyone else. After a few more long-winded rants about her deceased husband, she had her assistant bring tea and some biscuits. It was quite the British thing to do, but nonetheless I enjoyed it. I looked over all my notes, important details, alma mater, enemies, known associates, and even the names of a few city council members that had a negative opinion of Mr. Aranyaga. The next two nights I spent at the graveyard and the surrounding streets to see if there was any local presence of someone who might have done this. I know it's a long shot. But I've found in most cases, criminals love to return to the crime scene after the police have left. Thankfully, I wasn't police. I can spend all my time and resources following actual criminal behavior patterns, and not focus on regulation, nor rinse, lather, and repeat methods the kids are learning at <laughs> detective school. It rained quite a bit the first night. Nothing unusual occurred, though. The second night, it rained lightly, with a dense blanket of fog. But I could see everything, for state-of-the-art graveyard owners have never heard of thermal imaging of infrared. I set my watch nest on top of a crypt. Thankfully, it had a gazebo-like structure on top of the roof of the crypt, so I had pretty good shielding from the elements. Speaking of which... I also had the element of surprise, with a 360 degree view from my perch. I'd see anyone walk into this place. About 2.30 a.m., I saw the security guard on his cart to the last round of the graveyard before staying in the duty shack until 5 a.m. when his relief came. Ten minutes later, I had my thermal scope on the entrance of the graveyard, and it was intruder-free. What really struck me as bizarre, though, on the cement walkway I kept seeing splashes moving upward. Not quite the way rain falls and makes a small impact. I'm talking about actual touch-the-ground-with-mass type of splash. Maybe the rain in Spain is heavy from washing into the plains. <laughs> Not quite sure. I let it go for now. One eye still closed and the other still through the scope. It's all clear. Then, I start to hear grunting. Panting, almost. I turn my scope to the direction of the sound. And... nothing. But I see where the noise was coming from. It was from where the gravestone was located. 
I climbed down from my perch, almost sliding down the pillow with how wet it was, and rushed through the grass and flowers to see what could be making that sound. Was it another security guard? No. My watch says 2.45 a.m. I keep looking, and I see there's fresh soil that's turned up from the grave of Mr. Aranyaga. Only two possibilities right now. One, some deranged fan of sick fantasies is trying to reach some type of satisfaction or emulate the grave robber. Two, this is the grave robber and they're either coming to put the body back together or in pieces. As I turn around, I see a dark figure, almost impossible to see with the fog and rain. I lunge at him and he falls quickly too easily. I'm surprised someone who looked this big would fall that quickly. As I'm about to position myself and try to put them in some kind of hold, I feel my trench coat collar stretching, and then I'm tossed about ten feet. Ten feet by just one man. It was definitely a man. I didn't feel any breasts when I tackled him, so it couldn't have been a woman. Maybe some kind of circus freak, with terrible balance, but amazing strength. I feel an immense pain in my lower back and my ass. He threw me rear-end first into a gravestone, and I definitely felt some rubble fall into my trousers. I'd cracked the gravestone with my fall. I wasn't able to get up right away, but I saw his form. His void of a person there and I decided I might as well get a good look at him with my scope, so I could remember what to look for, and look at the being with my eyes, and it's almost as if he's so dark the light bends around him. As I put my scope to my eye, and stare at the exact spot he's at, I see nothing. There's no outline, no aura, no movement, no warmer or colder area. It's just void of anything. It matches the background to temperature extremely well. Some kind of high-tech wetsuit that masks you from thermal imaging? Maybe. I've heard of R&D developments of tech at the Pentagon. But not quite here in this ancient city. I stagger back up and I try this again. I punch this guy in the face. A clean, connecting hit. His head looks like he's got a case of whiplash. The strike made it almost pivot, but then it came back into place. He again tries to grab me by the coat, but I'm fast enough to take it off without him reacting in time. The piece of stone I had in my left hand is going to connect to his skull, and he'll be out. I cock my arm backwards and slam the stone as hard as I can. Then I do it again. This guy is still standing. I do it once more, and the stone crumbles to tiny pieces and dust. Whatever this guy is, I've pissed him off. He drops my coat and starts walking over to me. At least, if I can't beat him by myself, I can get the guard to give me a hand. I run towards the shack at full speed, and he's just walking. I knock on the door. I start banging on it. No answer. I decide to go in there myself. Maybe he's asleep. I step into the shack, facing the area where I saw the voided figure. He was about 50 yards away, and it looks like he's walking faster. From the illumination of the guard's shack, it's much easier to see things in the immediate vicinity. I turned around and I saw the guard slouched over his chair, face on his keyboard, with his limp, lifeless hand holding the mouse. This guy must have been the footsteps I saw earlier. I didn't even hear him walk this way, or keep sight of him with the lights around the shack. I look at the table behind the desk, and I see a baton. If cement can't crack his head open, maybe a bit of steel can. 
I see him now. He's approximately 20 yards away. I can definitely outmaneuver him, but I can't overpower him. I've got to think tactically on this one-man army. I stand there, adrenaline pumping and my heart beating, moving almost as if it hurt him. Now he's on full power, walking towards me. I extend the baton, and I'm readying myself for the world of pain I'm about to feel. I rush out, dodge his grasp and move to his right. Then I keep beelining until I'm behind him, and I feel the recoil of the baton against my hand. Almost immediately, my wrist starts to feel sore, and my hand starts to cramp making it difficult to hold this baton in the rain. I keep moving around him, so he can't get me in front of him. He's too slow. I'm going to take him down. Another crack as I strike the lower part of this guy's skull. I see him stumble forward quite a bit, and I'm almost certain he's finished for. I walk up to him as quietly as possible, but with a brave almost superhero type stance, I get ready to put him down. I'm not sure whether this will kill him, but most likely it won't with all the damage he's taken thus far. So, I'm almost certain this will incapacitate him. I crank my arm backwards, planning to use all the strength I have to put him down. I start swinging, as I'm about to connect the hit. It stops mid-air. I can't move the baton. It feels as if a vice-like grip has caught the only reliable weapon I have. The voided figure stands up, with the baton in both hands, and bends it, crumpling it like a kid would do with a straw. I couldn't believe he had that type of strength. I mean, you could train fighting techniques, Learn to use someone's body weight against them. But bending riveted steel like that. This has to be more than a man. This is some type of monster. I step back a few feet. And as more light is showing this void of a man. He seems to be wearing a coat. My trench coat. But he has some shoes. Slacks and a shirt with a tie underneath. I swear that pattern on the tie seemed so familiar, but I can't place my finger on where I've seen it. I decide it's better for me to run away. He can't catch me. No matter how hard he tries, he's nowhere near as agile as I am. I start sprinting on the concrete path, since the grass wouldn't be ideal in this type of weather. I start moving. I can definitely feel my lungs clear up with all the humidity in the air. I see the voided man, wearing my coat and that goddamn tie. That damn tie with all those geometric patterns and ridiculous shapes. I don't know where to run to, but I head about a mile and a quarter down the road, right where Mrs. Aranyaga lives. The streets are incredibly empty. By the time I get to her palace of a house, it's 3.15am. I jump the fence, and I go through the window I left open a few days prior. It takes me to the guest restroom. I'd come here in order to have a place to infiltrate from, when I suspected it was foul play on her behalf. Still, <laughs> sleeping with a widow isn't something I enjoyed. But it got me access around the house, in order to find personal clues and belongings, possibly a journal of Mr. Aranyaga. I waded past the bathtub and the toilet. I stared at myself in the mirror. My face looked gaunt, as if I'd almost seen a ghost. My hands looked white from punching the voided man in the face. I turned around. And I saw my back was stained with blood and dirt. My blood. That voided man's dirt. This was definitely an unfair fight. 
I had to pull out my last resort from where I'd hidden it, in the toilet reservoir. I'd placed my revolver in two Ziploc bags in order to keep it dry and concealed. I hastily put it in the small of my back and went out of the restroom. I went upstairs and looked through the window, and there he was. He had followed me here, almost as if the voided man knew I was coming. It's just odd how he went from stumbling to strong, getting even stronger with every hit I gave him. Only serious brain trauma with the madness seemed to rattle him enough for me to be able to escape. Now he moved, faster than I did, as if moving more and more made him ungodly fast. I don't understand. People are supposed to get weaker and more tired with the more activity they do, not some reverse dynamic. I go to the master bedroom, where she is lying, waiting on me to return. I wake her and address her without giving her a name or title. I don't want to detract from my professional activities, even if it meant doing this. She gets up, gets dressed. I tell her to take the kitchen to the garage and have the car running. I'll try to slow down whatever is here and run to the street once she's out there in the vehicle. I have my revolver ready. I don't think I've taken a life after getting my ass beaten so miserably. I start going down the main staircase to the foyer. Only mud and footprints there. They lead to the hallways behind the staircase. I continue walking and open the door ever so slightly. I see nothing. I continue down the hallway, and it's almost as if the voided man knew the exact layout of the house. I struggle to move effectively. My back is in pretty bad shape. I don't know if I could even run to the car if I wanted to. I search all the rooms with mud leading into them. It's next to impossible to tell where he is headed, or where he is currently with so many directions, and skips in the steps. I end up reaching the final door, the door to the kitchen. I walk in, hoping to smell exhaust fumes and hear the engine. For a moment, I thought I did. But it was cigarette smoke, and the sobbing of Mrs. Araniaga that alerted my senses back to reality. It was him. He was there. Fedora, trench coat, slacks, shoes and shirt. And that goddamn tie. Are you trying to fantasize about Araniaga by wearing a dead man's clothes, you freak bastard? I barked at him. Why would I fantasize about myself? That's when it hit me. There were signs of forced entry, because he had opened his casket from the inside. Could it be? It was no stranger than all the things I'd seen this voyage figure do tonight. You seriously think I'll believe you're a man who can't even walk a quarter of a mile, let alone a dead man? It doesn't really matter who or what I am, but I am what I say I am, he said in a low, gravelly voice. I couldn't wrap my head around how bizarre his voice sounded, almost like a reverberating music to my ears. I can sense the thick Spanish accent of his proper British English. Then, if it is you, then why go to the trouble of going back to your grave? What could you have possibly left there that's worth any value? Obviously not that piece of shit tie. Or my trench coat, I said defiantly to whoever, or whatever this guy might be. I went there for a very specific reason. I left my wife's wedding band there. I did not know she had thrown it in there with me. Burying the last twenty years of our life together. 
all so she can enjoy her selfish desires of freedom. After following my rule, defying my obedience even through my death. I don't believe you, not for a single moment. The real Aranyaga was a sickly man, who couldn't move, let alone fight as well as you did. This man was weak. No way he could have crumpled a steel baton like that. As I look over, I see Mrs. Aranyaga, and I see her wearing her wedding mat. He reaches over, grabs her hand with black, rotting flesh, almost as if he was a piece of walking mildew, a fungi gained sentience. I even see small pieces of skin falling off, resembling spores shedding off a strawberry. He plays with her fingers as he looks at me. You can't kill me. I died. And I will keep coming back. Didn't you see that anything physical does not damage me? This damn disease of mine makes me become stronger with every attack, faster with every movement. I don't even show up on your gadget's measurement reading, do I? <laughs> it's hard to see warmth in a cold body. I start to feel my frown burn into my face. I know for a fact it's now or never. I move to get her out of his way by kicking him and pulling her with me. I hear a snap. She starts sobbing even harder. That final pull. He tore off her ring finger, along with the band. I grab a nearby towel from the counter and wrap her finger as well as I can, hopefully stopping the bleeding. <laughs> I told you I am only getting stronger. You can't hurt me. You cannot kill me. He started turning around, walking away with all his dark, disgusting mannerisms almost taunting me to run after him, to hit him and make him stronger again. I decided enough was enough. I would follow him outside, and right there, in the driveway, I aim. I shoot him in the back of the skull. As he falls down, I get over his torso and fire six more rounds. The chambers are empty and spent. For being unable to be killed, he never expected that a bullet would be the thing to kill him. I got into the car and drove Mrs. Aranyaga to the emergency room, where they were able to reattach the finger. The cops and forensics came, looking at the body that was there. Her and I were holding hands. Her intact hand, that is. Covered by a blanket as the rain finally started letting up. It was 10.30 a.m. I had just witnessed something, someone, whose own disease, his own affliction, had made him physically unstoppable. Now, I don't believe in the supernatural, nor do I think this was a clever ploy by someone wearing a tinfoil hat. As an atheist, I truly believe his disease made him the way he is. I can only properly assume that the fatigue chemicals and toxins that slow you down in life bring you back tougher as a corpse. As a shell of what you once were. I can only imagine his lust for revenge on everybody with the ability to actually take it out himself. While I was with Mrs. Aranyak, Laying down in the master bedroom, I decided to check out his study, which was connected by a locked door. I managed to break the lock and remove it. Inside were dozens of photos of him and colleagues that did not look European. I'm talking about Native American, as well as East Asian faces. I was under the impression he had never left the Eurozone. I find some architecture drawings and more notes on buildings. As I'm looking through the loose leaf sheets, I see a journal, discussing all sorts of meetings, 
and affiliations with a network of people who reanimate after death. That, if you can prove your worth, they'll let you into their little circle of allies permanently. Now, the tenets he had to fulfill go as follows. Die a death by nature. Otherwise you cannot let the disease bring you back. The variety of disease depends heavily on heritage. The disease is key to immortal life. Through death you shall accomplish revenge of many sorts. It is advised to make as many enemies as possible, and destroy them when you reach the form you were destined for. It means the ending of everyone's widow as well unless the spouse has found a new suitor. Do not be cremated. Full form is required for ability to reach the next part of life. And that's about it. I couldn't find any references to diseases that bring people back from the dead, or afflict only certain races. What I do know, though, is that I had been fighting a zombie. A mythical creature made up by film directors to be the blue collars bogeyman. I never thought I'd hate anything so much. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you.